So I realize after the last show that I acted in a manner unbecoming of the voiceover artist, and for that I apologize. I drank too much and let out dishonest, craven feelings, and I hope you'll forgive me for those. And so I have agreed this time to read the script as written. It won't happen again. In a world torn apart by disaster, a new society has emerged. Scarred survivors band together, their shared humanity, the only thing that keeps them pushing on against the hordes. But amongst this chaos, a new hero has risen. In the tumult of survival, an idiot on a Segway rides around with his tackle in the wind and asks people about board games. This is the Guild. Starring Ben Maddox as the greatest person who's ever lived and Isaac Shalev as the piss pusher. Ben, what can be said about him? A, not only is he the greatest lover, he's also has a face that should be carved into the side of a mountain like those presidents or whatever. I think we can all agree that Ben is the acme of humanity. You know, one thing I never realised about the apocalypse, you never assume it, because you never see it, I never saw it on the movies, but how tasty zombie flesh is. And if you cook it just right enough, it's like, it's like pork. Uh, you know, you don't cook pork enough, you get the shits. And if you don't cook the zombie enough, you get the zombies. But you are amazing. You, you, these, these zombie sandwiches are absolutely fantastic. Good job. Well, I have to say that when uh, the leader told me that I could finally, you know, get out of the trunk and uh, take on a, a different job than scaring the bejesus out of you, um, right. I, uh, I I didn't think that things could get worse, but here I am um, making zombie sandwiches. But, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what kind of cook you were before the fall, but here, I mean... I mean, before you had a job where you were, you know, helping NGOs, you know, funnel money into bank accounts in the Cayman Islands, and now here you are, hitting the acme of human achievement, feeding me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I sh certainly my, my job in the past uh, trying to solve mankind's uh, largest problems uh, pales in comparison to my current work. Although, to be fair, given the current state of apocalypse, I, I failed at my last job, so it's not too surprising that I haven't been put in a position of greater importance. Um, I, I just hope I can get back to my passion of uh, mixing cocktails. Yeah. Well, I mean, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself because, let's be frank, human beings are terrible. And there's all this, you know, all this bullshit about, uh, oh, are humans naturally good or naturally evil? I'm just happy that the apocalypse has sorted that out all for once and we don't have to have that argument anymore. Yeah, I agree. And I think that for those of us who have survived, the real question is, uh, were we punished or rewarded, right? Well, I think I mean if you, if you look at you look at the current state of this camp this uh, compound, right? I as you know, go around nude on a Segway and ask people questions about board games. I would guess that all of you are being punished while the refreshing Sirocco from the mountains going through my ball parts is nothing but a boon for me. Huh, you know, you were so much more sympathetic when you weren't so self-aware. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, we would love it if you put on a pair of pants. That would be fantastic. But, you know, then you wouldn't get to see my nadgers, would you? Yeah, I think we're on the same page on that. So, you know, you, I, I saw you the other day. And you were mixing formaldehyde and cat piss, and you were serving it to the guests. What was the name of that cocktail? 
Oh, I, I, I was inspired by uh, the classic uh, Cape Codder cocktail, uh, one of my favorites from uh, old New York cocktail bars. Um, uh, now, that, that cocktail is really quite special, and, and it's tough to simulate with uh, formaldehyde and cat piss, but we make do in this apocalypse with uh, the best we can, trying to keep the memories uh, that were most valuable to us alive. What's a Cape Codder? Is that uh, a superhero a- fish? No, it's a vodka crayon with a lime. Oh, right. So, I mean, how difficult is it to be a mixologist in this post-apocalyptic world? I mean, there's not a lot of uh, cranberry juice, I can tell you that. If we found cranberry juice in this apocalypse, um, I think its best use would be making vodka crayon. And I think that every fraternity attending bro in the compound would agree with me. Is the douchey shortening of the word cranberry absolutely necessary? Uh, yes. Yeah. How, how else will I know that you're a douchey bro? That's that's very true. Well, I reckon you should go and see uh, you should go and see Quartermaster Mariner up at the supplies hut. He's he's got lots of stuff. I mean, you'll probably have to lose a toe to get some, but you know. That's a small price to pay for Cran, isn't it? I suppose he fancies himself quite the uh, coctologist. Uh, he's always making those fancy drinks, you know, the exactly the old fashions and I, the whiskey you stick up your bum bum. Exactly. Keep it simple: vodka Cran, maybe a twist of lime, formaldehyde and cat piss, maybe a bit of phlegm. <laughs> you know, and you thought marketing counted for nothing, but I got to tell you, I sell a lot more formaldehyde and cat piss by calling it vodka crayon. So, you know, how do you feel about the term mixologist? I was always confused by bar people who said, hey, I'm not a barman, I'm a mixologist. I, I, mean, I mean, is there is there a PhD in getting people pissed? Well, you can get a bachelor's in mixology, but if you want a master's, you have to take mixonomy. Um, right, okay. And that's, know, that's writing lists of lists of booze, is it? Uh, no, that's mixography. Ah, okay. Right, mixonomy is the study of the motion of mixed liquids. And so, what is the difference in viscosity between human urine and Scotch whiskey? What has the human been eating? Urine. Mm. <laughs> frozen, frozen piss pops. I gotta tell you that that sounds like a closed loop. That's just you know garbage in, garbage out, as we say. Well, it depends. It depends what you've. It depends if you're a breatharian, because I've been I've been speaking to someone on the compound, and they're a breatharian, and you know you're a rational human being. He told me you can live on nothing but your own breath. Does that seem plausible? No. No, or even mean, advisable no? to try. What do you mean, no? He looks great. Yeah, I, he, I've been slipping him zombie sandwiches. You've been giving away zombie sandwiches to the breath man. I, I mean, to be fair, it's hard to get rid of them any other way. <laughs> but it's so tasty. You whack some ketchup on it. Well, it's diorie but we call it ketchup. And they taste absolutely wonderful. Yeah, the apocalypse has not been kind to your taste buds. But it's been kind to my enjoyment factor. You know, the thing is, since I went certifiable nutso after the apocalypse, after I killed all of those people, my life's been absolutely blissful, you know. Yeah, I'm not actually sure why the leader tolerates you. We've all been voting to whack you for months now. What does whack mean? That sounds sexy. <laughs> right, no, uh, you know, when you whack a guy or you off a guy, not when you whack off a that, guy. All three, all three of them sound amazing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point. Look, why don't I mix you up some more formaldehyde and cat piss? I, I think that's the secret to enjoying the zombie sandwich. You first need to kind of burn off any, any receptors on the tongue. <laughs> That is amazing. You truly are a mix officer. <laughs> oh, I like that. I might I might uh, make up a, a fake diploma with that one on it. Well, anyway, you know, I am, as you know, chief entertainment in the compound. And as we discussed earlier, tackle in the wind, 
riding around, bringing joy to people's day and talking to people about board games. And most of them have got PTSD and they say, why are you asking me these questions? All of my family are dead. But some of them, the nerdy ones, they give responses. So this week, my question was, think back to the glory days of 2020 before that Mexican beer disease killed your family. Are games getting too expensive? Now, I heard you weighing in on this and you were being, I mean, not that you deliberately market yourself as a contrarian, but you were being contrarian about it. So, you know, 90 euros for Oath, which is a card game. Foundations of Rome, 120 euros, which is like, Splendor or something. A hundred euros. All of these Eagle Griffin games. Tell me why board games aren't becoming too expensive. Well, I think that there are plenty of expensive board games. There are probably more expensive board games today than at any other time. But there are also many, many, many more very affordable board games. And um, so to me, this really is a case of if the games that you want are more expensive than you are complaining that board games are more expensive. But, you know, by any sort of data-driven analysis, board games on the whole are more available at more price points and at higher quality than ever before. But what if the the literati of board games are going around saying, you know, this game is absolutely fantastic. This game is the the acme of design. This game is the high watermark for social interaction around a table. And that game, something like Blood on the Clock Tower, which I haven't played, which was ludicrously bloody expensive. I mean, get the resistance right. But, you know, the problem with board games is inherently... If the, if the acme of the art form is 120 quid, the acme of the art form is 120 quid and you can go hang. It's not the same with literature. It's not the same with films. It's, it's not even the same with music or art, which you can have access to for relatively low prices. Do you think there is a, a moral objection to games, to everything being $100 now? No. Elaborate. No. Oh, fine. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar <laughs> with the premise of this show, to be honest. You're being paid. It's not a visual medium. Now, if anyone could see you standing behind that bar in your leopard skin posy pouch and your twizzly wizzly nipple grips, then that would be amazing. But it's an audio medium, so you're going to have to talk. That's fair. It's, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm terribly distracted by your fishing tackle. Um, well, look, the the moral dimensions of the argument sound to me a little bit like. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a bourgeoisie complaint about the price of the opera. Um, the notion that the games coming out at these highest price points represent the pinnacle of design. Um, I, no, no, you get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, what if something that is the pinnacle of design is coming out at that price point? You can go to the cinema for reasonably cheap. You can you can buy the paperback version of the book. There's no other cheap option for the board game, no? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, to my mind, um, pretty much any board game is 30% cheaper six months out. Uh, so it's hard for me to decide that there's some kind of moral challenge with having to wait six months or even a year for, you know, gratification on that front. Um, I, I Look, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the notion that... Um, there's uh, a price to be paid for participating in this hobby. I don't love that that's the case. Um, and I recognize that that represents a kind of gatekeeping. You know, certain people can't enjoy some of these games. But I don't think that the industry or the community has ignored that fact. And I think that it's actually quite affordable, even those most expensive games, um, to play them. There are many opportunities to do so at uh, conventions or at local meetups. Um, there are plenty of opportunities to share the costs of an expensive game with the four or five friends that you might be playing it with. Uh, you know, dollar for dollar, uh, and, and you know, folks on Board Game Geek and, and such used to love doing these calculations of you know, fun per minute and minute per dollar and so forth. But I mean, a hundred dollar game, four people, um, you know, play it twice, and 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 it's the cost of the cinema. So, I, I just don't, 
you know, I think the the collector's hunger, the desire to own, is more the moral question and not the price of the game itself. I mean, do you think there's a moral issue? Do you think there is a moral issue with acquisition disorder and this desire to own everything and fill every available space with games? And is the industry, I mean, surely the industry profits from that, no? No doubt. Uh, look, the humans like to own things. Um, many have a predilection towards collection and classification uh, and an obsession with, you know, mis uh, filling in every gap. And, uh, and moreover, you know, as people, we decorate ourselves, our identities, our homes as a way of communicating and signaling and community building. There's good and bad in there, and there's, you know, better and worse ways to do it. I, my, my collection at over 300 games is um, obscene at some level, right? And there's no doubt about it. Um, but also modest relative to, I don't know, my brother-in-law's collection of golf clubs. I mean, I mean, what's really interesting is I still think there is, even within the hobby, this feeling that gaming isn't somehow a seemly or desirable pursuit, that it's somehow still something that is beneath the realm of cinema or the realm of literature, because no one bellyaches and an insanely large book collection. 90% of the books will never be read again, right? No one, Or the first no time. One's, right, in many cases that too. I mean, no one says, oh, I can't believe that you, you go and see Bergman and Kubrick retrospectives. My God, what a waste of time. All the electricity used in the cinema to power that. Do you think there's an inherent sort of feeling that what we're doing, this hobby that we immerse ourselves in, is still, even among the people who love it, somehow a childish pursuit that is kind of beneath our adultness. Yeah, I, I think there's a shadow of kind of frivolity that uh, falls over the whole, the whole, uh, the whole pursuit. I remember as a kid, I loved toy soldiers, and I loved, um, you know, seeing those those war gamers who had made these incredible uh, tableaus and 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 tables, um, and and I I mean I played with little plastic men, and my mother always tried to get me to stop, especially as I grew older and continued to play with them. It was a concern for her that I was playing with you know age inappropriate toys, um, and my father said to her let him play with whatever toys he wants to play with and when he is successful in life he'll be able to play with whatever he wants to play with and it doesn't matter who's laughing because he'll be laughing too and i love my father for for that so much because um we shouldn't be ashamed of the things that we love especially if they don't hurt anybody else or trouble anybody else we should embrace the things we love and I believe that the role of um, a hobbyist and, and to some extent the role of a critic is to help people love the things that we love. That's that it's humans aren't always good at knowing how to enjoy things. And that's part of how we contribute to, to a civilization, to a culture. I mean, I think what's really interesting about board games is, is people, there, there seems to be a generation of people who are resistant. I interviewed a very famous game designer who whose interview will be coming out soon. And I spoke to them about the concept of art. And, and firstly, the reason he designed games, he said, was, was super interesting to me. In that he said, I design games because I'm because I really want to write novels, but I'm too lazy to write a novel. And then he said, you know, games inherently should employ cliche because games cannot tell us about ourselves. They cannot speak to the profound human experience. To which I said to him, but what about the grizzled? And he said, well, yes, then, okay, the grizzled is an exception. I mean, do you think there is a generational thing? Do you think this new generation of people who are entering games, who didn't come into, like people like me, even though I'm a little bit older, 
didn't come into games through the conventional being super into it when I was a kid, Avalon Hill, D&D, da 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 da, that are coming from maybe a different artistic background or a different professional background, have a different view to not only what games are, but what games can be? And, and if so, do you think that's good? Well, I think it's pretty similar to other art forms as well. The novel is kind of instructive, right? Because the novel... Well, well the novel was thought of as super frivolous when it first came out, right? Entirely, and, and it's it's a, a relatively new medium, right? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, there weren't novels about 200 years ago. Um, so we see that they started off being pretty frivolous, and they eventually grew into an artistic form, but they didn't lose the frivolity either, and so today you still have plenty of genres, including um, things like bodice rippers, including a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. Um, but I mean, just there's there's no shortage of writing that is not intended to be high art, is intended as an entertainment product, is intended as fun storytelling, um, and and just doesn't ask or expect uh, for for a critical eye to be placed on it. And that's true, I think of. At today, still, 90-95% of games. But there are games that break out um, despite not trying to, right? Despite not necessarily intending to. And there's a genre of games and a group of creators who are actively doing something else with the games. And there's finally an audience that's responding to it, that's, that's playing along. And that's what you need for art. You need the art and the community that receives the art. You can't have one without the other. And unfortunately, even though I do it myself, unfortunately you do kind of need the critic as well because they are the ones that mediate the art to the people who consume it, right? Even though critics are essentially bottom-feeding scumbags. I include myself in that. Yeah, I, I don't see that as a requirement. You, you don't have to be an asshole. You just choose to be. But critics are wonderful. So I was having a chat with... Uh former doyen of British game design, the last person I saw before the apocalypse hit and I'm convinced he's turning into a zombie, young Anthony Boydell and he said to me, and it, you know what's amazing is I barely remember my own name but when it comes to these recollections of conversations I have about board games, I can say them word for word I'm truly the reigning man. So, of course, products like Tapestry have taken the required level of quality seen inside, for example, where the layered player boards are essential and the midi is kept to a minimum, to an unnecessary level. There's useful deluxe components and then there's just ridiculous, wasteful, earth-polluting pimpage. And I guess my question is, firstly, do you think publishers in the current age when we see wildfires all over the world and the Paris Accords falling apart. You see, I'm, I'm talking, I'm pretending to talk about the past and all of that sort of stuff. Do you think there's a, an, a requirement from publishers to tone down the excesses of production? And secondly, a sort of wider question, do we want more people in the hobby because more people will result in more consumption, which will result in more pollution and then we all die? Well, I'm going to take that second one first because I think it frames up uh, the response to the first one as well. Um, if you're going to advocate for any change in a system, you have to think at the margins, which is to say you have to think what will happen if people do what I'm suggesting. How will they substitute for uh, whatever we're saying they should no longer do? Um, and if you say, you know, we should limit the hobby or fewer people should come into board games by whatever mechanism, and let's not get into that. Um, what will people do instead of buying and playing board games? And will that be more environmentally destructive than buying and playing board games? Uh, and, you know, my sense is that board games are, generally speaking, something you play at home, uh, so you're not constantly driving to and fro. Um, they're not a particularly heavy or resource intensive product. They're made out of mostly renewable materials. Um, I understand they're not all perfectly biodegradable and there's, there's more to do to make them even more sustainable, but they tend to be reused for decades and reusability is the best kind of sustainability, right? Reuse first, then if you can't, then you recycle. Um, 
So, do you think the trading of board games, the the games you don't play, the shelf of shame, and you put them on BGG and you give them to other people, do you think that's an inherently environmentally uh, responsible act, even if people aren't, if, even if that's not the motivation for it? I don't know. Um, so, look, I, the, recently, um, before the end times, uh, Ravensburger started using stickers, adhesives, to close up boxes instead of shrink wrap. And this engendered a, a huge debate over why they did this, what were the environmental impacts, and more generally, the question of, you know, user preference and convenience versus publisher versus, you know, everybody else. And um, what uh kept being reinforced for me is that we're so bad at really understanding uh all the different variables that we need to to say this is better than that um i don't know if trading board games is better because i don't know if that shipping cost and that air freight uh that you're using to send the game you know across the country balances out because it's additive in the sense that if you didn't sell the game, if games weren't for sale, then new games would be bought in their place. New games that are already being shipped to stores, right? And I, so I, I just, there's, you'd actually, you know, need to analyze this and, and, and study it to know what's better. That actually, I think, brings us to the challenge of what should you do. Most of the time when we act, especially on issues like environments, system size issues, we don't act out of knowledge. Right? Our actions are to signal a value, not to actually drive it forward. I mean, what is your view on the tapestry dildos? Because regardless, the, the problem is we live in a world of optics. We live in a politics of optics. And, you know, vavavoom is more important than actual substance. And regardless of the sort of environmental impact of producing them, they look terrible in the context of environmental disaster no especially as they kind of have no use do you do you think there's a publishers are sort of it's incumbent upon publishers to be responsible in that way and it's and yeah i mean again what's your view on the tapestry dildos because they seem hugely irresponsible uh, certainly as pointy as they are um well indeed yeah uh irresponsible is a, is a I don't, I don't want to throw that word around. Um, look, I think that publishers should uh, live out their values and market to an audience that embraces those values. Um, and I think that everyone makes a choice which interests they want to chase. So some people will chase prurient interests. Some people will chase, you know, baser instincts. Um, and, and Is that that film with Sharon Stone? <laughs> uh, well, it certainly leads to dildos in, in tapestry, right? Didn't she, didn't she put an ice pick up her own for Fufa uh, you know, in that movie? The, the specific details of that movie escape me right now. Uh, <laughs> I know she crossed her legs. I know she crossed her legs and it was a big deal. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I recall, I recall her, her protestations that she was unaware of of where that camera was and what angle it had. But I found that hard to believe because I've been involved in lighting for, for video and you really can't miss a 10,000 watt Klieg light aimed at your snatch. And a real big camera. Yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, so the, the challenge is this, right? Any publisher can say, okay, I'm not going to do that and I'm not going to make these fancy components and I'm going to be more responsible and so forth. And that doesn't prevent any other publisher from choosing to do that instead. What we know about markets and what we know about economics is that if there's a niche, it will be filled. It's a collective action problem. No single person and no single producer can solve it by choosing not to engage. So, I, I think there's a hypocrisy inherent in the human condition. I mean, if you sort of look at Twitter, right? Twitter is Twitter is the sort of bedrock was of ben, human was. hypocrisy was thank god thank god it's gone and the only twitter we hear now are the mumblings of the zombies but you know people complain about things that are easy to complain about and yet you know the the maxim of give me convenience or give me death seems to still hold 
true, right? People are not willing. So if, if I mean, surely the specter of Chinese manufacture, not because China is an inherently evil country, but the fact is you need to transport those games to where they're going to be consumed is an issue. Yet it seems that people are unwilling to either take a hit in quality or a hit in price for these games, right? Is, is, that, is that not an inherently immoral position when you consider environmental disaster? I think that it is. Um, the tools for solving that problem effectively are different. And I think that th this, is, this is really what it boils down to for me. There is no prize for acting morally but entirely ineffectively. So f if it is a moral imperative... But haven't you heard of the acting morally but totally ineffectual prize that's awarded every year in Shitsville? <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, I mean, uh, you know, we know about, we know about um, that prizes and so forth um, in this industry are, are often influenced by things like components and that, you know, every blogger and podcaster had those lists of, you know, best art, which really was never a list of best art, but largest dildo in your box, right? Right. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I am put off by some of the excess. There are ways to try and address this problem that might be more effective than kind of stamping our foot or, or even castigating publishers. You know, when Arcane Wonders is, is making, you know, Foundations of Rome for $140 with these really elaborate um, structures and, and, and miniatures and so forth, they're not doing it because, you know, they, they want to, uh, you know, fuck Mother Nature in the ass. Like, that, that, that's not what's driving them. They're doing it because they need to compete in a market. And this is a way to stand out. This is a way to create something that not every other company can copy. <laughs> and they're doing it out of a sense of intense competition. So I'm not too thrilled with then going around and bludgeoning them with my moral cudgel. What I would be more interested in doing is working with industry groups like Gamma to identify sustainable manufacturing. I'd be interested in working with human rights groups to identify uh, factories in China that are treating workers appropriately, right? I would work towards compacts industry-wide for manufacturing standards, for environmental sustainability. That's where you can make a difference. You have to work from a governing body, from a place of regulation, from a place of group enforcement. You can't do this by kind of stamping your foot and saying those are plastic dildos in a box. So, I was having a chat with Nick Shaw, NJ Shaw 2, and he gave me a list of things for game things rising. I'm going to read out the list and I want you to say how plausible you think this reasoning is. Are you ready? Let's do it. I, I like the enthusiasm. Well, it means that we're getting closer to the end. You know, <laughs> being in your company is also very pleasant, too. Just put on a so, pair of pants! I can't! It's my... it's my... trademark. All right, let's hear it. So, he says, The reasons are obviously many, but seem to be a combination of the following. Expectation of consumers to have a super high production value to make the game look amazing. Pretty much the fault stroke success of Kickstarter stretch goals, I'd say, which publishers have to then implement so the game at least has a chance of being noticed amongst the massive swathe of other games out there. That's what you said about Foundations of Rome, basically, right? Yeah, it's certainly driving that part of it. I'd only caveat that there are other ways to compete, uh, and I think that uh, Ravensburger and Blue Orange are great examples of companies that are are increasing their scale, printing at larger numbers, and driving down prices. And you can see that from games like King Domino and games like uh, Jaws, uh, which are extraordinarily available with still terrific uh, prices. Disney Villainous is another fantastic example. And increased production costs. Is this true? I would have thought with, you know, companies like Panda and all of this sort of stuff, the production costs would have been gone, would, would be going down with more, with... What, what's what's the term you use? Workflows being put in in place that benefit everybody, no? 
Yeah, I mean, production costs are lower on a per item basis. So we used to uh, avoid making dice with custom molds or more than one mold or whatever because it was too expensive. And those costs have plummeted. Um, similarly, uh, you know, we used to care more about cards being in multiples of 54 or 55 or whatever because of the sheets and so on. There, there have been a lot of advances in production technology that I would say production costs costs on a on a per pro, on a, on a per item basis are lower but what ends up happening is you put more items in the box so hesitancy of retailers and distributors to order large volumes because of fears they won't sell and will be left with a whole load of stock they have to pay for warehousing for meaning publishers end up doing lower print runs which reduce the bulk production discounts from manufacturers further pushing up the base price this has to be the archetypical argument for too much product being out there. The board gaming is about to explode. The bubble is about to burst because there's just too many games, right? Yeah, th this is kind of the story of our time. Um, I don't think it's uh, a bubble so much as uh, a tide, right? The tide is going out and we're going to find out, you know, who like you refuses to wear pants. Um, right. But but it's absolutely the case. And, and to just give a little insight into that, um, when distributors are faced with this ocean of games, so many thousands of games to stock, what they're doing is they're essentially buying to their retailers pre-orders and not much more. And because that's money, right? What the retailer pre-orders is sold and they don't have to hold on to and they don't have to worry about it. Um, and then they're restocking on an as needed basis. They're essentially taking no risk with their capital. They're not saying, let me buy $100,000 worth of this game, even though I've only got pre-orders for 50K, right? And ultimately that's just a matter of the distributors don't have enough money to buy every game and stock it and stock it in depth and so forth. Um, and that creates enormous challenges because there are, uh, if you're a retailer and you call your distributor and you say, hey, can I order, you know, another six copies of, uh, I don't know, um, what's a hot game that we can use? Um, I would like uh, six copies of, I'm looking around. My Isle of Cats. Isle of Cats. Perfect. I want six copies of Isle of Cats. And the distributor says, oh, um, that's out of stock because they don't have any, because they sold it all. And the publisher is sitting on thousands of copies of Isle of Cats. And the distributor might not reorder them or might not remember because the, 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 you know, the retailer says, okay, well then, never mind. I'll just take six orders of Mariposas, right? So it's an enormous stress on the industry. It's killing a lot of publishers and honestly a lot of distributors and if you want to talk about who's really at risk i think we're going to lose uh some distributors from from the hobby uh, industry in in the coming you know year of the not apocalypse that i'm projecting because we role play it exactly so increased distribution shipping and custom tax costs are they are they increasing Ah, if you bundle them all up together like that, maybe. Shipping has certainly gotten a lot more expensive. Um, customs and taxes, eh, depends. Um, it, they were higher in the 90s in most places. Um, they were lower in the last 10 years um, prior to the Orange administration in the US. Um, and they're higher now. Mm, that's not the real, that's not the real thing. Um, and, and distribution is cheaper, right? Because you don't have to use a distributor for your distribution. So um, Kickstarter and all those direct sales and Amazon stores and buying direct from the publisher and pre-order and all that stuff drives down the cost of distribution pretty substantially, right? It's a pretty enormous difference. Um, it's changing business models that are responding to those prices i don't i don't think that in general we can say it's more expensive now because of these things i i i, mm, I think it's cheaper actually and this one i think really really is right the willingness of just enough gamers to buy at these high prices to make it financially viable for publishers to keep doing this now do you think that there are publishers who are going okay we've got this game it's by this designer who's quite hot and it's 
the the you know times 10 to production cost valuation msrp thing should be this but fuck it we can whack an extra 20 quid on because these dickheads on kickstarter will pay it i mean is that <laughs> happening um i haven't known uh publishers to be quite so um cynical and and um abusive of their customers in the current age I, I, you know i really it goes the other way um so look you know you, you might spend 60 dollars today for a video game a triple a video game you might spend 60 70 even 80 dollars for a triple a video game and that video game represents millions of dollars of development and its contents are so much blingier and so much more over the top than any board game, full stop. There's not a single board game that can hold a candle to the production of a AAA video game. Um, we, we just don't apply the same standard uh, to those sales and to those products as we do to these physical board games. And, and maybe we shouldn't, I don't know, but it's, it's, worth, um, it's worth making that comparison and asking ourselves, why are we so furious about board games rising in production quality and standards and having prices to match? What, why is that so, like, every other product that we have in our world has, you know, luxury versions and, and, and you know, I bought my car with the, you know, double leather zebra wood package. I don't know. I mean, shouldn't you be more mad that Teslas and Rolls Royces exist than that, you know, Foundations of Rome does? But but don't we want don't we want a hobby in which we're not pandering to that consumption-based capitalist class-ridden bullshit that infuses everything else that you can't go to an art gallery unless you wear the right clothing that you know you have to drive a certain type of car to be respected don't we want our hobby to be a little oasis of decency and classlessness where people regardless of their background and upbringing and the way they talk or the color of their skin or where they like to put their genitals can be treated equally and a large way towards equality is money how much you can afford can't we aspire to something more horizontal and less poncy i don't think that um where we are or where we're headed is contrary to to what you just laid out uh, so, so put it another way um i don't want a world in which all board games must cost either $10 if it's a card game, $20 if it's a small box, and $40 if it's a big box. Uh, I don't want that world. I think that's a uh, world in which we have poor quality games, in which we have the best uh, potential designers doing something else, not doing this. Um, and, and I think we wind up with uh, a shrunken community that is nothing like what we are experiencing today. So no, I don't want any of that. I recognize that there's games that people want to buy that they can't afford, and I'm comforted by the fact that there are many amazing games. Some of the greatest games of the last few years are totally affordable, completely inexpensive. You can buy Hanabi for $7. $7. To my mind, it's you know one of the five best cooperative games of all time. You can buy it for $7. So I don't, I just don't feel like the argument that expensive games are, 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 you know, ruining our community holds up. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to head off now because the unfortunate drawback of these delicious zombie sandwiches is that it does result in rather a lot of diorioria. So I'm going to nip to the latrine. Uh, it's going to sound like I'm having a number one when I'm having a number two. But, you know, if you want to come and listen, you're more than welcome. Well, it's amazing that you make this audio medium as disturbing as actually having to watch you. Will Ben ever have a firm stool again? Will Isaac ever erase that terrible image from his mind? 
Do you think that I should pick up a copy of The Guardian tomorrow and look through the- Yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry. I know you're excited. I know that you want to go to the guild. 3,209. And tell Ben how great he is. Do it now. <laughs>